I'm Miles Richardson. I'm going to talk about our connection with with nature and ways to improve it in some of the, the, the research we've done. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter, should you wish, and the, the blog I mentioned, the address, is, the address is just there on the slide. Um, so we'll, we'll kick off. We'll kick off by saying, covering something that you'll be, you'll, you'll be sadly aware of. Um, remind ourselves of why our relationship with nature matters and why why it's failing so there's a picture there of the of the, the school strikes for climate um, which you'll have seen um, biodiversity loss loss of insects just being one um, sad example of that i think you can relate a third crisis to our failing relationship with nature as well the, the crisis of, of mental health and the four minutes 36 seconds there for any of you wondering that's from a study that we did in Sheffield in the UK that was the the median amount of time that people spent in green space each day so I think that's a, 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 a nice indicator well not a nice indicator uh, an indicator of our failing relationship when we're only spending four minutes or so um, in in nature each each day And I always think it's very odd how people don't question whether fish need a river or birds need the sky or apes need the forest, but we spend millions of millions of pounds of research money trying to show and trying to prove that people benefit from nature. And that's, I'm involved in that, I'm, I'm involved in in showing that a connection, a close connection with nature is good for well-being, but it's kind of a sign of our disconnection that we we have to show that the, the habitat that we evolved in is 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 good for good for our well-being, just as it's good for all the other wildlife out there. We would never question that. And when you ask people if they feel part of nature they tend not to be so sure, which is very odd. But there's kind of 90% of people aren't fully sure that they're part of the natural world, which raises the question of where, where do they think they're, they are part of. And our technology starts to define us more and more. And we're a, we are a, a technological ape, a technological species. We're, we're nothing without our our technology and it's our te technology that's seen some, some of the, 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 the amazing achievements that uh, we've made as well sadly at great cost in many respects so it's technology that's taken us out of a, a kind of hunter-gatherer existence a few hundred thousand years ago um, living on the savannah or in the forest or, or wherever and it was technology that saw the agricultural revolution and the scientific revolution and the industrial rev revolution and the rise of technology um, such that we feel now that we we live in our own little box the human box that was created through the enlightenment and the scientific revolution where we started thinking in that way and we have a box for nature and as you all know the sadly the, the nature that's living in that box is is in decline and we're not too aware, many of us aren't really aware of, of, that, of that decline, which is a very sad situation to be in. So we like to think that we're a nation of nature lovers. I mean, I'm in the UK, uh, so I, I know our cultural heritage uh, better than it is in Ireland, but I suspect that uh, you've got your, your, your poets and artists and um, who, who celebrate and love the green and pleasant islands that we, we live, live in. Um, but when you start to look at the data, um, we've got a very low relationship with nature, a very poor, weak relationship with nature. So this chart is a little bit difficult to under, understand, but I'll put two big red arrows on it. Um, people's nature connectedness is along the bottom. So three over to five there. And you can see that 
there's a group of European countries that are, are, are over four there. And then below four, if you uh, think about it, they're all English speaking, first, first language English, uh, United Kingdom, California, Australia, Ireland is just, just on the cusp of the four, Canada uh, and Hong Kong. So we seem to have a particular uh, problem, perhaps the seat of the industrial Western um, lifestyle is something to do with, with the particular disconnect that we've got. And we're bad of the, it, it, it's a global problem. There are no countries that are currently meeting the needs of their population within the resources of their, within the natural resources of their um, country. So globally, we're disconnected with nature and then we're at the bottom of, of, of some of those groups as well. And there's a few indications of why there, which is some recent research we've been doing. We found that um, the higher a country's level of income, the more the more smartphone penetration it has and smartphone ownership it has, the lower level of biodiversity, the weaker the relationship with nature. The more pasture land the country has, the weaker the relationship with nature. Uh, and not so much urbanization, but urbanization is related to to lower relationship with nature, but not so much as you might you might think. So nature's missing from our our lives. This is a a, a UK um, five ways to well-being. So you might you may or might may not be aware of it, um, but when you look at the guidance. There was a 300 page report that, that produced these five way, ways to well-being. It doesn't, doesn't mention nature in the report, um, despite it being uh, known that it's very good for our well-being. And this is only from uh, 15 years or so ago, and it's still used, but just an indication of how nature lacks any meaning in our, in our lives in, in critical areas, like our models of how we understand well-being doesn't include nature in our uh, most prominent model and you can also see it in our books and films so this this is a chart that shows nature words that have been used in english fiction so you can see the, the all these dotted lines uh, going around uh, close to 100 percent and then from the 1950s onward there's a there's a decline of of references to 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 nature words particularly trees and flowers there um, and I've added on this, this blue line, and that is some other research uh, by, by some other researchers, but I've put it onto the same chart. That's ind individualistic phrases. So from the 1960s through to 2000, people were writing more about themselves uh, than they were than at the same time as the natural world was, uh, references to the natural world were in decline. And when we think a lot about ourselves, we tend to miss out on other, on other important issues that, that, that might be happening. And we've done research that's, that's found that um, people who take more selfies and use their smartphone more tend to have a, a, a weaker relationship with nature. And that's captured very nicely there by Ralph Underhill, who's a, a good cartoonist and general good guy so there is some hope though that's a bit of a, a sorry story there's some latent connections that are quite fascinating and the, these pictures all represent groups of of research the flowers are some re research that showed that if you got people to uh, look at a bunch of roses for three minutes and you wind them up so you could see what their heart rate and uh, various aspects of the, their body were doing. You found that they, it, their, the sympathetic, parasympathetic uh, nervous system, and you could, you could detect the changes from viewing the roses. And it was a soothing and managing our emotions simply by looking at pictures of, of roses and. Um, there was a similar bit of research done, same kind of measures that were done by asking people to put their hand on 
various materials and it was obviously controlled so people couldn't see it and the, the temperatures trying to control the temperatures and such like but when people placed their hand on oak their palm of their hand on oak you got the same soothing effect and how nature managed your emotions so your body the human body reacts to nature even without knowing that it's touching nature so there's this kind of innate latent connection to the natural world which is really fascinating and that you get that same effect if you're stood in a forest um, as well and there's also research that shows that people who um, grow up and live near woodlands um, have a better developed amygdala in the brain which is the part of the brain which is involved in managing emotions as well and there's some fascinating research these little micro biome type micro type figures there are represent recent research that shows that the good bacteria that keeps us well our bodies are, are more than 50 percent to cells from other other life forms um, the good bacteria that help keeps as well you find that more in uh, wooded areas and more natural areas and you don't find it in kind of amenity green spaces as well so uh, people who again who live near woodland have have um, better exposure to the good bacteria that helps keep us well because we're part of a relationship and the starling there is just some research that we've done that shows that people are really good at spotting biodiversity when you ask people to rate the level of biodiversity in a place they tend to 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 get it right or to get the level right they don't they can obviously get the number right but they 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 can spot more biodiverse areas and, and less biodiverse areas so there's lots of latent connections and they're kind of um physical but becoming psychological because we're taking the journey from the physical through to managing our moods which is obviously emotions and nature connectedness is different contact and exposure which is i've just been talking about it's about our emotional relationship and our sense of relationship with the natural world so that's the, my main topic of of study and it's an internationally recognized psychological construct we can measure it with carefully designed scales and we've designed interventions um, that um, show that it's malleable we can improve it um, that allows us to do more research to show the value and meaning of having a close relationship with nature and people are starting to say that having that relationship with nature is a basic psychological need and potentially a, a, a right uh, that we, we should have and it's been used included in things like the Gallup World Wellbeing Poll so there's there's a lot of recent interest in in that concept of nature connectedness which is put simply our kind of love of nature emotional relationship with nature and, and sense of belonging within the natural world and so what the research allows is we can find out why nature connected us matters why close relationship with nature matters and from the the theme of of your of, of these talks over the next few days this is perhaps a a primary concern um, for you it's that it a closer relationship with nature brings more pro-environmental behaviors so peb there means pro-environmental behaviors and there's causal evidence with that. So if you increase nature connectedness, you tend to increase pro environmental behaviors. So that's one very important reason to uh, to focus on nature connectedness. And globally, the UN and organizations like it best are starting to see that our relationship with nature is is a is a uh, the causal issue, a main issue of, of that we need to we need to tackle. So when you can measure nature connectedness, you can find things out like this. So the numbers I shall explain here, this is our um, nature connection index that we developed a few years ago, uh, and you can score up to 100. And for people who score 47, for example, on average, they report doing nothing for nature and knowing of pro-environmental behaviors. 
the average in the country in the UK is 61. And for people who report that they do recycling, the average is 63. Recycling is relatively easy nowadays. So you can see it doesn't take a great deal of effort. And so it's you only need to be up around 63 on average to be engaged with that. But when you get to more committed actions that require more time and commitment, the average becomes 76. So you can you can see in quite a simple way how the closer you get to nature, the more you do for nature. And then the second aspect of why nature connectedness matters is, is human well-being and people's well-being. And you can see lots of the benefits there that uh, are scattered around um, the, 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 the jumping person. Um, everything from feeling good to functioning well. So feeling good, things like happiness and vitality to functioning well, personal growth and having meaning and purpose in your life. And then some more unusual things like having a better sense of body image or uh, better pro-social behaviours. And these circles, the green and blue circles, this is where we've looked at how nature connectedness, socioeconomic status, which is a kind of government benchmark, and nature visits, how they explain having the feeling that you're li living a worthwhile life. And you can see that it was nature connectedness that explained feeling that you were living a worthwhile life four times more than your socioeconomic status, which is, as I say, is a kind of government benchmark. So your, your relationship with nature is more uh, important than your purchasing power, I suppose, when it comes down to it, as to uh, how worthwhile your life is. But we're not led to kind of consider that. The adverts that we see are, are encouraging us to, to, to spend, to, to have meaning in our lives. So that measure of nature connectedness, you can also look at that across the lifespan. So here you can see going from seven years of old, old on, the, on the left to over 70, and you can see how there's a, an adolescent dip, a teenage dip, where it, it falls quite sharply to, to 13 to 15 years of old, uh, years old, and then recovers slowly at around 30. And that, there's lots going on clearly, for, for adolescents, so it's a time when you're forming your identity and various changes in your life. You move to secondary schools to focus on exams. So there's personal and environmental factors. Um, and our friend, developing friendships perhaps matters more than um, our relationship with the natural world. So it dips at that point. And that's been found all over in populations around the world. And you can see my green line there, that's the 76. So perhaps that's what we need to be aiming for, for a sustainable, relationship with the natural world. And then quick reason as to why the adolescent dip matters. This is some research from Canada where they looked at 30,000 uh, Canadian adolescents and they found that those who rated their connection to nature as important had 25% reduction in mental, mental health systems. So they're, they're, uh, symptoms. So they came to the conclusion that that engagement with nature was protective for psychological well-being, which is obviously an important, important thing of, at any time in your life. Being able to measure nature connectedness and having that perspective on your relationship with nature also can help challenge assumptions. Quite often people use environmental education and to improve people's relationship with nature and encourage ecological behaviors. And this is just one example there's, there's many examples that have, have found this, but this has just got quite a stark statistic where they um, looked at improving the environmental knowledge of, of children, and they found that it explained 2% of the children's ecological behaviours, but their relationship with nature explained 69%. But there's, there's many studies that have found that general picture and general story. So hopefully, uh, you kind of convinced from that short journey that through the some of the basic research that nature connectedness is a good thing. It's it's good for nature and it's good for good for people. It unites human and nature's well-being. So we've set out to to find out and develop ways to increase nature connectedness, and quite simply, that's 
through prompting people to actively engage with nature and you can you can get sustained increases by by doing that and we found that for example um during the the lockdowns where people engaged with nature more i'll, I'll come back to that a little bit more there we are because it's on the next slide and so noticing nature matters but people don't tend to notice nature so this is some work that we did with the national trust in in uh, in the uk um, and we found that 80 percent of people rarely or never watch wildlife or smell wildflowers or photograph nature and 62 percent of people never listen to bird song to, to to say that you never listen to bird songs such a a, a a strange thing for people who are who, who are engaged and closely connected to nature and as i say in lockdown we found that noticing nature increased by about 74 percent a lot of the focus went on people were visiting nature more which they did visits went up 40 percent but the noticing of nature went up 74 percent and it was the noticing that better explained people's well-being during that time whereas the, the increasing visits didn't uh, um, in, uh, relate to, to or explain higher levels of, of well-being. And that's one of the key findings from, from some of the research that we've done is that visits and contact are different to connection. And connection tends to matter more for, for, for mental well-being, particularly feeling like you've got a worthwhile and meaningful life. So we do research studies to, to, to try and find out the effect of what works and to trying to bring nature connection into, into modern life. So we can't demonize technology. Um, we've got to try and use it to connect people with nature. So this, this was a study in Sheffield that we uh, designed a, a phone app that was aware of the thousand green spaces in Sheffield and when someone wandered near one, it prompted them to notice the good things in nature and to write down a good thing in nature. You can see there, 500, over 500 adults took part, including some with uh, mental health problems. And we measured um, mental well-being at the start and at the end, and then a month later. There was another group that uh, looked at built objects rather than natural objects. And what we found is significant increases in mental health and nature connectedness which were sustained for one month and that improvement in the quality of life for people with a mental health difficulty reached clinical significance so it was a real meaningful change it wasn't just a kind of statistical uh, artifact it was it was a meaningful change for for people and we also found that the people who gained most were those who tended to spend less time outdoors and we're less connected to nature so if you can prompt people uh, to engage with nature it, it's really good for them um, but we had to pay people to to use the app which just shows you how how far we've become disconnected and where you have to, to, to provide an incentive to engage with the natural world so it starts to provide a causal link that if you improve people's relationship with nature their mental health tends to improve as well and we've done that test, used that good things in nature um, intervention several times now. Um, we've tested it in, in gardens and that worked. And we've tested it in a clinical sample. This was research that was done in Ireland actually by one of our master's students um, who got people walking in groups and then doing the three good things in intervention while walking around modest, you know, urban parks and the, and the like. And they found that uh, the nature connection went up by 30%. And this was six weeks after the, the walks. And their well-being was up 42%. Mental well-being was up 42% compared to just staying much the same in the control group where, where they, they didn't notice the good things in nature. So it just shows how powerful it can, can be. And we're developing new interventions all the time, including a, an audio meditation, which you can find online. On my blog so we've done we did some work for for the mental health awareness week last year which was themed on on nature and there's a simple story and it, that we just stop 
look, listen and enjoy nature. And that was our simple green care code. Um, it's a very simple instruction and uh, um, it, it, it helps. It helps for your mental health and it will help for your pro nature and pro nature conservation behaviors as well, which I've not spoke about as much, but we've done work looking at pro nature conservation behaviors as well and nature connectedness and noticing the simple things in nature uh, works for those pro nature behaviors as well. So we can't just go around noticing the good things in nature, but many of us do, but we, such is the kind of global issue with the relationship with nature. We need, we need a more transformational and more societal change. And one of the things that we've produced is the pathways to nature connectedness. And these are the types of activity you can see, you can see here, the types of relationship, the types of things that you can do in nature um, that you need to try to activate to improve nature connectedness. So we'll just quickly go through those now. And you can see that at the top of the people who've been in using the pathways, lots and lots of people are using them now. And it's quite a flexible framework. It's, it's not, you can do all the things that you currently do and, and just look at them through, through the kind of lens of the pathways and, and tweak what you're doing. It kind of promotes ideas with people. So the first is, is kind of very simple, sensory contact to look, listen and touch nature. And we've got some simple advice where we're encouraging everyone to notice and actively engage with nature. That's the key thing, to simply notice and actively engage, but providing prompts to do that. And then there's emotions. This is a really powerful um, pathway. It's a pathway that's used in uh, consumer product, consumer ad advertising. You'll, you'll see how adverts try to tap into your emotions. So the consumer world knows how to engage people through emotions and we need to, uh, we need to copy that kind of message and it's something that came through in our research. So we're encouraging everyone to engage emotionally with nature, to find happiness and wonder in nature and to note the good things in nature as I've just been saying and to find joy and calm. And there's research out there is if you just prompt people before they go for a walk to, to, to notice the wonder of nature, they get more benefit from that walk than if they just take a, a normal walk um, through, through the woodland or through, through nature. Then another pathway is noticing nature's beauty, which you, you kind of is obviously related to other pathways as well. You've got to sense it and be there. Um, be out in the natural world to do that much of the time. And then there's research that showed that people who benefit from nature tend to notice its beauty. So encouraging people to, to, to notice and engage not only with nature itself, but the beauty of nature. It's just kind of another key prompt uh, for people. So again, we're encouraging people to find beauty, to notice beauty in the natural world. Um, to spend time to appreciate beauty and engage with it through art or, or, um, um, or in words, for example, whether it's wild art or poetry or taking photographs um, and or just simply pausing for a moment to, 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 enjoy a, to enjoy a view. And then meaning, another very powerful pathway. We're always looking for meaning in our, in our lives. And I mentioned poets and artists earlier, um, much of our greatest poetry and works of art focus on, on nature. So it, it's, a, it's a, a cultural part of, part of our lives and our cultural heritage. So we're encouraging people to explore and express how nature brings meaning to their lives, to notice how nature appears in songs and stories and poems and art to celebrate nature and to, to, to start to sing about nature again and include it in our songs and words of fiction and films and to celebrate the, the signs and cycles of, of, of nature. And that can be through things like um, folk tales and uh, the, the 
recognizing the, the, the calendar of, of nature and the fall of the leaves and things like that and letting nature be your, your story. And then the final pathway is doing good things for nature. What can, considering what you can do for nature, having compassion and com care for the natural world. And we're encouraging everyone to think about what they can do for nature, to take actions that, that, that are good for nature. And they can be simple actions. If, you're, if you've got access to a garden or a community space where you can um, uh, create some homes for nature and habitat for nature. And then hopefully when that nature arrives, spend some time noticing it. That's some other work that we've done. If you do actions that bring visible nature to your to your patch um, it then it feeds back into increasing nature connectedness and increasing those behaviors so it's kind of like a, a spiral of, of uh, effect if you can do things that uh, create visible biodiversity so some examples there which um, are, are kind of was we see in, in many lists of such things from feeding the birds to uh, wildflowers for, for pollinators and nest boxes and general homes for nature or volunteering um, for conservation charities and the like. So they're the pathways to nature connectedness. Five, you, you don't do them all, all at once because that can be a bit contrived, but we're trying to fit them in where you can. And it tells us that we what we found in that research was that some of the traditional approaches like in Increasing knowledge and a scientific relationship with nature didn't relate to nature connectedness. And when you think of it, if you think about relationships that you have with your friends and family, um, what types of lasting relationship are based on facts and figures? They're not. And our research shows that a new and sustainable relationship with nature comes through noticing emotion, finding beauty, meaning and compassion, just as you would develop a relationship with a, a friend or a partner. That's how you form a closer relationship and a caring relationship with the natural world as well. So a little bit drawing towards a, a close so we can answer a few questions on, on the impact, the application of the pathways. Um, it's been widely used. Many, many organisations and people are using the pathways now. The, the national, we did some work with the National Trust to use them. They came up with their own uh, diagram to, to, to uh, tell their staff of, about the pathways and how to use them there. And they were used in the initial design of 30 Days Wild in the, in the UK, if you're aware of the, the Wildlife Trust's campaign. A, a million people took part in that over the first five years and that improved their, their, their well-being, pro-nature action um, that lasted two months after they took part. So we recorded that at the start of June, the end of June after the 30 days and then again in, in September. Um, the National Trust used it in the refresh of 50 things to do before you're 11 and three quarters. But we're also starting to be creative with how you can apply the pathways more broadly. So at scale, because there's such a big problem that we can't do it kind of one by one on individual with individuals and, and small groups. We can you can apply the pathways to to places and spaces which Durrell have done from their butterfly house there. There's a big drop uh, to urban uh, green infrastructure. So the things and that we have in our urban places can be designed around the pathways as well. And education curriculum, health services, transport. You can you can really scale up how you apply those pathways to prompt those types of engagements with with nature to bring people closer to nature. So here's just one very simple example of, of, of what we did in 50 things to do before 11 and three quarters. So we had climb a tree, which is, you know, all, you can still climb a tree, that's great. Uh, we just changed it to, to get to know a tree, activates, opens up a few more of the pathways. You can listen to the tree, you can look up through the tree, you can still climb the tree, you can hear the tree at, at, different, at different heights, you'll see different things, hear different things. So a very simple change, but just opened up that, to be able to engage with more of the pathways. And similarly, canoe down a river, that, that's kind of quite purposeful. We changed that to floating a boat. So you can still float down the river and paddle, paddle a, a fair way if you wish, 
or it just prompts you to think, well, I'll just I'll just float about and, and take it in. And similarly, again, go bird watching. Bird watching has um, the kind of idea that you you might need to use binoculars, you might need to know and be able to identify the birds. But you can still you can watch a bird. You don't need to know what type of bird it is. You can watch it and enjoy it. And you can we've shown that if you watch birds for the joy of watching birds, you 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 get you get some increased benefits out of that. So there's lots of further guidance that's available. Uh, should you wish to look at more, there's um, our uh, new relationship with nature booklet, the green one there, which is a, a a, a few years old now. Our new Nature Connection handbook, which has only been out a month, so that's available from my from my blog. You can download that. That's a, a nice document that's gone down very well. Uh, Nature and Me, which is a joint publication with the National Trust, again available via my um, blog. More focused on the work we did with the National Trust. Then some case studies, lots of case studies in the Nature Connection handbook, and then. If you're more interested in the kind of wider, bigger picture, scaling up our relationship with nature, the, the Mental Health Awareness Week, they their policy team produced a policy briefing, and it's really imaginative, um, creative document about how you can apply the pathways at, at, at scale, to kind of more of a societal scale to, to improve our relationship with nature. So that's that's a good read if you if, you, if you're interested in that type of thing, and you can. You can Google that and find that. There's probably a link from my blog as well, to be honest. So just a quick summary. The human nature relationship is, is failing, sadly, um, and that's causing the, the, the warming climate and the loss of biodiversity. Um, but a close relationship with nature unites human and nature's well-being, which is really important. You can have one target that, that delivers benefits for, for, for two issues. Um, and it can be targeted and it can be improved and you can deliver sustained benefits. So it is possible. And at its simplest by creating moments with nature, using the pathways to nature connectedness to prompt those, those moments. So that's me done. I'm very happy to answer some questions. I think we've got about 15 minutes if, if, there's, any, if there's any questions that people want to ask. Oh, brilliant, Miles. Thank you so much for that. Um, yeah, if people have questions, they can pop them into the uh, the chat there or into the Q&A. But I suppose I've, I, I have a few myself or a few thoughts that, that occurred. The first one um, was definitely around that, that piece that you did in terms of, um, you know, countrywide nature connection and where the, you know, the, the English speaking countries were, were faring not so well are there any theories in terms of why the other countries that were slightly better you know what is it that that is the difference there is is there a is there a clear-cut answer and maybe there isn't yeah no, there's rarely a clear-cut answer is there in life but there there are indications that i've just last week i published two blogs on this so you if you go to my blog there's there's a lot more detail um but yes, there, there are indications, biodiversity, we're, um, I don't know about Ireland, but the, the, the UK is the, one of the most nature depleted countries on the planet. If there's, less, if there's less nature to notice, there's less chance of forming a close relationship. So those countries with a higher relate, a closer relationship with nature tended to have more biodiversity. Uh, they tended to, um, use their land differently, the more arable farming compared to, 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 to pasture land seemed to be a, um, an issue. They, they weren't as wealthy, their levels of income were lower and they uh, tended not to be using technology so much, not, not to be um, uh, using smartphones so much. Um, yeah, so it's that kind of um, those nations, those particularly Western Europe, Western offshoots, America, Australia, Canada, uh, which were perhaps at the 
seat of I'm not, I'm not a historian, but the seat of the industrial revolution and the rapid gain in, in wealth. The, the wealth in those countries was kind of, um, I think, 17 fold. It's grown since the early 1800s and in, in Eastern Europe and, and Central Europe, not so much. And, and there's a very much a consumer culture there. And I think that's probably comes down to that um, battle for attention. And there's less nature to notice. We tend to get involved in other things and um, and that breaks down the relationship. Yeah, it's really interesting. And I mean, it's, it's so relevant to the work that we do. And I'm sure some of the other people who are here can see how it could be. Um, how relevant and, and another thing that and I promise then I'll, I'll pass over but another thought that that occurred to me was um some you know where you were finishing up there and talking about um the connection and how we form the connection and traditionally I suppose there's definitely been a conversation around you know environmental education and how we you know we we point at a tree and we tell you that's a an oak tree and and it's all very a uh, label orientated and and needing to know the names of these things um, and I did a tiny bit of research that found that actually that then means that people don't have confidence you know teachers particularly maybe to go and bring kids just out because they don't know the names and um, so I wonder I, I, first of all I think it, it's really useful to know that not knowing the names is fine and actually maybe yeah. sometimes of benefit and um, but I wonder is there and backlash is probably too strong a word because you know it's it's quite I'm sure a friendly community um, involved in this uh, type of work and research. But is there any kind of push and pull around that idea that you know the value of being able to name and know and having knowledge where that fits in this whole story? Yeah, that there there is. It doesn't come up. Yeah, you're you're right. Back back backlash might be too. To, we're, 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 we tend to be friendly, <laughs> but that, that's the question that when I'm uh, with organisations rolling out the pathways, that tends to be a question that comes up. Oh, but, but I deliver science, and we've been doing we've been doing knowledge and identification for years, and uh, and, and I'm a scientist, and I, I like facts and figures, but. The evidence shows that, and, the, and there's more than the pathways evidence now. There was a recent um, meta-analysis where they gather lots of studies together, and that found that environmental education didn't particularly improve people's nature connectedness very well. But it doesn't mean to say that you don't do knowledge; you just combine it with the pathways. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the people, you know, I've been on walks with the experts in in fungi and taking me around the woodland and I've seen them taking other you know kids around they're full of amazement and wonder and emotion so you can you can talk about very scientific concepts and you can make it wonderful and that you are then tapping into the emotions pathway and you can make it meaningful by talking about the, the networks Within a within a woodland, and then the networks within people that that combine that bring people the the web of life, I suppose, into into that, which it creates meaning of of, of why we're here and um, and that type of thing. So that you can do it, but yes, there is a a focus on the traditional kind of approaches is identification and knowledge and uh, and focus on that's not the the most productive way and um but yeah people still like to 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 do that yeah thanks and um, well, karen i don't know are there any questions there coming through yeah, I, I see some lovely comments question, yeah there's one question here from thomas uh he says very interesting talk miles uh and um the words rocket and science come to mind is there any difference between the kinds of nature for example the ocean version versus woods mountains etc are any more effective in terms of connectedness, well-being, and so on? Yeah, we we kind of don't know in in some ways um, because nature connectedness is quite quite young, quite young. It was the, the first research paper um, was that mentioned it was two thousand and one, and then the research really took off from twenty twelve. So it's not a vast amount of time. And there has been lots of wilderness studies over the, over the past where people have taken groups out into into 
into areas and that can improve nature connectedness but we focused on more everyday urban environments where people live and bringing it into 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 people's lives in that way and, and the simple things a cobweb on your wheelie bin um, can be a, a source of a source of wonder so i suspect there might be differences in the types of, of in, uh, types of landscape and awe inspiring landscapes might might be more powerful you know you, if you go to the alps for example you, you've got a very powerful uh landscape and that might be that might do more for 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 some people so yeah i don't think we know there has been photographic studies where we've just shown people pictures of various landscapes and so that they might tap into that but what we know is that real nature is more powerful than than virtual nature so yeah a kind of bit of a don't know but i would have thought that yes the 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 more engaging, the more meaningful, the more awe-inspiring a, a landscape, probably the more powerful it could be. Great. I think there's there's maybe time for for one or two more questions. There's one here, which I think is is getting to you know what you, you're touching on there as well in terms of you know how how the connection is happening. And it uh, Brendan is asking um, the mechanism for communicating the pathways. For example, how important is the messenger? Are passive methods such as printed guidelines less effective than active methods like walking? Um, and then I suppose the next, a second question, an add-on would be, um, how important are the pathways for action? So identifying ways in which engaged people can then knowledgeably act for nature. And um, is that part of, of the, the whole piece? Yeah, so yes, active, active engagement, matters we we've done some work and some others have done work that have looked at nature documentaries and and reading reading books i mean there, there are nature writing books that are very emotional aren't they, and lyrical and uh and this is suggesting that they can they can play a role um the the three good things in nature task is fundamentally a writing task it's not a reading task but it, it shows you the power of of, of of language and power of words for engaging people so I think there, there can be that indirect engagement with nature but I think it's still got to activate those those pathways emotions and, and, and meaning and, uh, as I say and uh, you know it can be beauty as well through poetry and, and the like um, and then the second part of the question was more about the pro nature behaviors wasn't it and mm -hmm. yeah I, that um We've done some work on that, and I've not. I didn't. I, that's another an, another chunk of slides, so I didn't include that. But yes, we've we've developed amazingly. There there wasn't in psychology a pro nature conservation behaviour scale. So you know, psychologists we like to measure people's behaviours. There was pro environmental behaviour scales, which is things like recycling, uh, resource use, pollution, carbon use. That that. That general chunk of behaviours, which is, as I say, carbon footprint, carbon use, pollution. But there wasn't a scale to measure pro nature conservation, habitat creation um, um, activities and behaviours. So we created one of those and we've looked at, at that. And nature connectedness explains pro nature conservation behaviours to a large extent, as does simply engaging with. With nature simple those simple engagements like we've been talking about um, listening to bird song uh, and the like those are very important for pro nature conservation behaviors but there's less work being done on that because as you know biodiversity loss is the poor cousin of climate change we hear a lot about climate change there's targets for zero carbon which is all great but biodiversity loss is as, as a is as big a problem but it doesn't get the coverage um so yeah if you from the work that we've done if you start to improve nature connectedness pro nature conservation behaviors will will improve as well but there is a causal link between more the more general pro environmental behaviors and nature connectedness more work's been done on that because the measures existed to to do it um yeah so you can use the pathways approach to to improve pro nature behaviors 
I don't know if there's any we other have, comments. We have one more question. Uh, if we have we have three minutes left, so I'd say let's go yeah. for it. Um, Albert's asking, do you think blended a uh, blended approach? Do you think blended approach, both factual and tapping into connection, is a good idea? Yeah. No, I, th I think as I was saying, you can you've got to engage people, and facts and figures can engage people. That, that you can you know. Fit, over 50% of the human body is, is microbiome cells, microbe cells. That's an amazing fact. But you can, you can then bring the meaning of that and how that means that we're interrelated with nature in a symbiotic relationship all the time. And we're not just, just that kind of me inside our brain that we think we are. We're, 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 we're working in tandem with nature all the time. So yeah, you can deliver facts, but try to just keep in mind those capturing the emotions, capturing the meaning at the, at the same time, but not to a point where it's contrived, because that's, I think that's the other thing. It's kind of, don't try and um, activate the five pathways with every sentence and every activity, otherwise it starts to become a bit kind of repetitive. It has to be where it works and people are doing that creatively and it's, it does, it's quite a new thing. So you, you have to, to kind of get people in a room and, and, and kind of stomp some ideas around. That's always a good way to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that that's nearly it, Karen, is it? We might have to, to, uh, to um, call, so, yeah. yeah, call the, yeah. the evening I've, to a close. Um, yeah, no, that's okay. I've just, on that last question there, educational policy, uh, y y y yes. We're doing it. We're doing a little bit on that, but not not a massive amount. But there's lots that could be do, done to to bring to activate the pathways in our curriculum. And our curriculum is very fact based. And people who know the labels for things tend to have a weaker relationship. That's another. My most recent blog is on labels. People who know the labels or their relationship only goes to the labels have a weaker relationship. Read more on my latest blog post <laughs> if, you, if you're interested in that. Great way sure. to end this. Yeah, there's a lot of reading there. And I think this has really set us up just perfectly for um, a weekend of, of considering. And now when, we, when we're out in the burn over the weekend, we can all be conscious of how it is that we're um, interacting and engaging and um, yeah, looking to activate those pathways. So Miles, thank you so much. Some really great comments. People I think have really enjoyed the session and, and got quite a lot from it. So uh, we appreciate it. And there was a question there um, about whether it will be available and it will. We will be adding it to our YouTube channel over uh, the coming days. So we, we appreciate you, you coming along and particularly to Miles. Thank you very much again. And hopefully see some of you in the burn over the weekend. OK, excellent. No, thank you very much. I enjoyed that. Great. Thanks, all. Yeah, enjoy your weekend. Thanks very Good much. Place. Thanks, Miles. Thanks, Anya. Cheers. Bye.